lift up praises to the Lord. And as you've sung today, indeed, that's what I trust has been in your heart. Uh, uh, hallelujah is a word of praise. And as we worship him, we certainly want to praise him. This morning, I'm going to be uh, preaching from the gospel of Matthew chapter 23. It, Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Let me also invite you to take a listening guide. I hope that uh, you were given or you picked up as you came here in the room and you can take some notes. Don't forget there's a children's version of this, uh, and, uh, this listening guide. And so feel free, uh, kids, to pick that up. And those of you watching through live stream, you can download this at fbcborough.church. But let's consider something Jesus was emphasizing in Matthew chapter 23 when he was talking about the scribes and the Pharisees being hypocrites. And what I want us to consider today is how can we avoid in our lives, how can we avoid being a hypocrite based on the concerns that Jesus had all these years ago? So let's read from Matthew chapter 23. I'm reading from the New King James Version, so if your version or your Bible app is a little different, it should read pretty much along the same ways, and I think you won't have any trouble following along. Matthew chapter 23, beginning at verse 1. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, Greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Verse 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Wow, those are pretty strong words from Jesus, aren't they? <laughs> he wasn't pulling punches, pulling punches was he? He was just laying it on the line. Uh, he apparently didn't have much tolerance for people who were, as he calls them, hypocrites. A Puritan uh, pastor from several centuries ago uh, made a great statement. His name was Thomas Watson. And he said, uh, you see it on the screen there, hypocrites are like the swan, which has white feathers but black skin, or like a lily, which has a fair color, but a bad scent. And then he writes, Lord, let me be anything rather than a hypocrite. <laughs> anything in the world, just whatever, Lord, I, let me be anything other than a hypocrite. Do you know somebody at your workplace or in your group of friends or in your social circles that is kind of lives like a hypocrite. Now don't shout out any names, please. <laughs> Have you ever been guilty yourself? Living, as some people might say, you're living like a hypocrite. Well, what does it mean to be a hypocrite? The word hypocrite is kind of a strange looking and sounding word, but it, it, it comes from the root idea of being a stage actor. When you consider how the word's formed and how it's used to be a hypocrite, is somebody who went on stage and played a certain role. And what does a stage actor do? A stage actor gets on the stage and he puts on and pretends he's one thing, but in actuality, he's really something else. He pretends to be someone that he's not. And in ancient days, they'd often use masks and, and to change characters. They didn't always change costumes and all that we think today, but one mask would be one character, another mask would be another character. And so if you wore a mask, 
and pretended to be something you're really not. You were a stage actor. So Jesus says, you see stage acting, not just when you go to the theater, but people in their religious life are putting on masks. They're pretending to be one thing, but in actuality, they're really someone or something else, a hypocrite. The word is used 20 times throughout the New Testament. But what's interesting, the 20 times the word hypocrite is used, only Jesus ever spoke, the way, only Jesus ever used the word hypocrite. The apostle Paul who wrote one third of the New Testament never once called anybody hypocrite. John the beloved disciple who wrote the gospel of John and the revelation never once called anybody a hypocrite. Peter, who wrote the, the epistles of Peter, never once in all of his preaching called anybody a hypocrite. The only time the word hypocrite is used is when Jesus uses it. That's quite interesting. And of the 20 times he uses it, seven of those times are right here in Matthew chapter 23. He had a pointed message to these uh, so-called religious leaders. He called them hypocrites. They were just stage actors pretending to be one thing but really they were something else. Here's the main thing to know as we consider how to avoid being a hypocrite. Faith isn't right if faith isn't real. It doesn't matter what you do, the rituals you follow, all the rules and regulations like the scribes and the Pharisees, faith is not right. You don't have it right unless faith is real. You gotta have the real deal. You can't have an imitation put on faith. Faith isn't right if faith isn't real. So, so how can you live a real faith? A faith where your friends don't say, well, you're one thing on Sunday, but something else on Monday. A, a faith where your college uh, friends don't see you having one view of this and one view of that. How can you have a real faith? Well, let's consider some of the signs that Jesus gave us, the signs of being a hypocrite. Let's look, walk through some of these scriptures and uh, see what the Lord Jesus himself will teach us uh, here through the scriptures. One sign of being a hypocrite, according to Jesus, is to have words without deeds. To have words, say all the right things, but the deeds of your life don't match up. Even today we talk about you gotta not only uh, talk the right talk, but have the right walk. <laughs> Your talk and your walk, you gotta match. You gotta have the right beliefs, but you also gotta have the right behavior. You can't follow Jesus just with your lips. You gotta show it in your life. And Jesus said the problem with these scribes and Pharisees is they may have said all the right words, but their life didn't show it. They had words without deeds. Notice verse three when he says after they're sitting in Moses' seat, that means they're, they're to be the teachers of the law. But therefore, he says, do whatever they tell you to observe, but do not, accord, do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. That was the main indictment right there. They say, but they do not do. And that was the problem. You hear something similar when the brother of Jesus named James, writing his little book at the end of the New Testament, he said, don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer also. You ever heard somebody say, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only? So James, the brother of Jesus and Jesus himself are tapping into the same thing. You can't just say things. You can't just hear things. You got to do it. You, your life needs to show it. Even today, we have these these phrases and expressions that talk about that. You ever heard the idiom, uh, do as I say, not as I do? <laughs> and what does that mean? It means we're admitting that sometimes our life doesn't always match up, but do what I say, not what I do. That was the problem with the Pharisees. They would say, but they did not do. And have you heard the phrase, actions speak louder than words? Same idea. Now, my mama, who was a great theologian in my life, she's from Piedmont, South Carolina, so she said it a little differently. She said, I can't hear what you're saying because your actions speak so loud. The Pharisees made that mistake. They, they, they would say, but they wouldn't do. I wonder if I've ever been guilty as a pastor, saying things, but in my life, not backing it up with my actions in my behavior. Have you ever been guilty of saying you believe this and saying you support this and saying this, 
but your lifestyle wasn't consistent. See, Jesus said the indictment is, is they say, but they do not do. I wonder in my life, in your life, are, are we guilty that we say something, but we don't do something? We, we say the gospel ought to go, the message of Jesus ought to go across the globe to the ends of the earth so everybody of every tribe and tongue and culture can hear, but we don't make any effort to even go across the street to tell our neighbors, our lost neighbors and lost friends about Jesus. We say, but we do not do. We say we care about the poor, but we pass the poor every day with no second thought, no second glance. And do we help local agencies that are trying to work against the disadvantage of the poor, pushing back poverty, pushing back homelessness? We say, but do we do? We say we're pro-life, we go to the ballot box and we say we vote pro-life, but do we support these unwed mothers when those babies arrive? Or do we shame them for having a child out of wedlock? Do we work to undo the social systems that are feeding the frenzy of unwedded pregnancies? And do we ever give even a dime or a dollar or a minute of our time to the local pregnancy resource centers right here in our own community? We say, but do we do? We say we're against racism, but do we perpetuate the stereotypes of black and brown people? When we hear racially insensitive remarks, do they go unchallenged and unchecked? Worse yet, do we post them ourselves on Facebook? Do we form meaningful relationships with minorities and people of other necessities and ethnicities? And when was the last time we had a person of a different skin color in our homes, sitting at our dinner table, having supper with us and our family? We say, but do we do? We say we're people of faith, but do we live any differently? Do we raise our kids any differently? Do we spend our money any differently? Do we live our lives any differently than a lost and unbelieving world at large? And we say we're following the Lord Jesus, but we live life on our terms, according to our schedule, according to our wishes, according to our whims, taking no thought that Jesus said, deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Perhaps the indictment of Jesus still rings in our heart. We say, but we do not do. You can't have words without deeds. Jesus said, that's what a hypocrite does. To say one thing, but no evidence in your life. It was Kyle Eidelman in his uh, pretty good book entitled, Not a Fan, who made the statement, biblical faith is more than something we confess with our mouths. It is something we confess with our lives. The proof, as C.S. Lewis said, the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> Don't just say it, show it. You say you're a follower of Jesus. We say we love him beyond everything else. We say everything belongs to Jesus. Jesus, the problem with those religious, religious leaders way back here, they would say, but they did not do. A second sign of being a hypocrite according to Jesus is activity without intimacy. All oh, these scribes and Pharisees did a lot of good works, good religious activities, but it didn't, they did it for the wrong reason. It wasn't because it was a flowing, intimate relationship with Almighty God. Notice verse five. But all their works, they do, they did lots of works, Jesus gives them that much. <laughs> all their works they do to be seen by men. That's why they did it. They make their phylacteries broad. Then he explains, look at all the works. They, they make their phylacteries broad. Now, let's be honest. If you live in South Georgia, you probably had no idea what a phylactery is and why it's so broad, right? <laughs> Basically, it was a small leather box you could hold in the palm of your hand. And faithful Jewish folks, inside that box would be little portions of scriptures. And at each edge of the box, it was sewn with 12 stitches to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And they would have uh, their leather strap. They'd put a box under their left arm and strap it to their arm so they could hold it close to their heart. They'd also put the, the box on their forehead and wrap it around their head. And that was the way that the following the teachings. And, and so Jesus said, look, look at what they're doing, but they want everybody to see it. You see their good work, their phylacteries, look how they're wearing it. And then he also talks about the, their, their garments, verse five. 
Their phylacteries broad, they enlarge the borders of their garments. You ever seen maybe an Orthodox Jewish person with those tassels dangling beneath his coat? Those, Jesus said they're, they're doing all the right garments and they're doing, wearing the right phylacteries. And he says, they, verse six, they go to the feast, they're in the synagogue. They got lots of activity, but there's no intimacy with the Lord. Their religious activities were a poor substitute for an intimate growing relationship with the Lord. Now, before we get uh, too upset with the scribes and Pharisees, Baptists have cornered the market on church activities. I mean, we've got this event, that event, this program, this committee, this group, that ministry, this special event. I mean, we may, we, we may not wear phylacteries fastened to our forehead, but boy, we got religious activities on top of activities on top of activities, don't we? But have we made the same mistake thinking all these activities represent the same thing as intimacy with Jesus? And could it be that our activities begin to mask the fact that we really don't have intimacy with Jesus? Oh, we're busy. <laughs> Look at all the things we're doing, Lord. I'm here, I'm there on this group, that thing. But Jesus says he doesn't want activity without intimacy. I've mentioned before that our church, um, in our computer system, our church, we, we have installed a special software package just to manage all the activities of our church. What rooms are being used what day and youth are doing this and the children are doing this, senior adults over here. We got this mini bus going here. We need air conditions in that room. This has happened on Monday night. That's happened on Thursday afternoon. We have to load special software in our computer system just to manage all the church events and activities that we have. <laughs> But is the goal to have activities or to have intimacy and a growing relationship with Jesus? In the midst of all that activity last March, boom, COVID hit <laughs> and everything shut down. I remember for the first month or two, it was uh, me preaching to 115 empty pews. <laughs> everything shut down. And what's interesting now is we're beginning to bring things back. We're asking the question, all the things we did before, were they helping us accomplish the mission of our church? See, the goal, it's not been just do everything we've done before, but the goal is why did we do what we did before? Why did we have all those activities? Why did we have things eight days a week? Why did we do things morning, noon, and night? Why this, why that? Now, some of them were, were great and purposeful and we need to keep on doing them. Maybe other things, maybe not. See, our goal as a church can't be to keep you busy. Now, we, if that's a goal, we can get it done. <laughs> we can keep you busy. But the goal is not to be busy, but to be growing spiritually. And is it possible that we had so many events, so many activities, so many programs, we thought that was the goal <laughs> And we really weren't helping people grow closer to Jesus. We kept them busy, <laughs> but we weren't helping them to grow closer to Jesus. As, as a result of a multi-year visioning process, we developed a next step spiritual growth process called the, uh, the disciple's life. There's three parts of a disciple's life. If you wanna grow closer to Jesus, whether you're a college student, senior adult, you're in high school or somewhere in between, if you wanna grow closer to Jesus, there's three things you need to have in your life. You need to be living by faith, number one. That's that upward component. Then you need to be living in community. You need brothers and sisters in Christ, relationships. And then third, you need to be living with purpose, going outside yourself, serving others, reaching others, discipling and mentoring others. And that's the upward, inward, outward component. You could also call this the upward, inward, outward life, where you live by faith, live with community and live with purpose. So our goal as a church is to take all of our activities and make sure they're funneling and supporting people, you, so you can grow spiritually. That whatever we do helps you to live by faith and then live in community with brothers and sisters and to live with a greater sense of purpose. And there'll never be a time in your life 
where you don't need to live by faith, community, and purpose. So let's don't make the mistake of confusing a bunch of activities with intimacy and spiritual, growing spiritually instead. A third sign Jesus gives of uh, these hypocrites is there was outward change without inward change. Outward, noticeable differences, but nothing was happening on the inside. Look down at verse 25. Jesus says, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Jesus uses two illustrations to um, uh, shine a light on this outward change without inward change. The, the first is the washing of the outside of the cup. He continues in verse 26, blind Pharisee. In other words, how can you miss this? First cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that the outside of them may be clean also. They're blind, how could they not miss it? Even children know. What good is it to clean the outside if you haven't cleaned the inside? How'd you like to go to somebody's house for dinner and say, don't you worry, we have washed the outside of every dish. <laughs> every fork we've washed on the, on the one side. <laughs> I'm not so sure that'd be very appealing. And don't you, when you wash dishes, meaning the old fashioned way with your hands in the soap and water, <laughs> and you go to wash a cup, don't you instinctively wash the inside first? You ever thought about that? Because Jesus said, you're blind Pharisees. It's not the outside that really matters. It's the inside. Not what people see, but who the Lord knows that you are. The second illustration is in verse 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. So the whitewashing of tombstones in the spring of the year after the rains had come, the, the, the custom was to clean the tombs, whitewash them, and, and they looked beautiful. But Jesus said, what good is it to, to whitewash a tomb when really it's full of dead men's bones and uncleanness? What good is it to make on the outside if something's not right on the inside? But how many times do we go week after week and, and we make pretty on the outside? We sit in our Sunday school classes and we give an outward appearance. We talk a good talk, we know the right things to say, we go to our workplaces, we go to our college campus, we go to our high schools and middle schools, we go golfing with our buddies and we make everything look good on the outside. But Jesus said, what's, what's going on on the inside? And one of the signs of a hypocrite is to have all this outward change, but no inward change. Remember our main thing to know today? Faith isn't right if faith isn't real. And Jesus just excoriated the scribes and Pharisees for their fake, artificial, plastic faith. So how can you and I avoid the same mistake? How can you go to work tonight or tomorrow? How can you go to your campus? How can you go amongst your friend or family groups and make sure that you are the real deal? How can we be the real deal that same on the inside as the outside, that our walk matches our talk? Well, a cross-reference passage is a four or five pages to the left in Matthew chapter 11, where Jesus contrasts what he expects from people versus what the scribes and Pharisees expected. He already told them they got it wrong, but Jesus shows you how to get it right, how to be real. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, come to me, Jesus says, all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, don't miss what Jesus is teaching here. Now, the gospel of Matthew is, has the most Jewish flavor to it. That's why in chapter 23, he talked about the phylacteries and the, the broads because you have to explain, but he, Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience and, and they understood immediately what it meant by phylacteries and, 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 the, and the tassels of the garments. And here, 
he's using some Jewish references as well in chapter, chapter 11. Now we read this thing about a yoke and we think um, he's talking about farming because we're in Bullock County and we love farming and agri- agribusinesses. But if you're not talking about farming, he's using the analogy of rabbis and teachings and religion. The scribes and Pharisees got it wrong. Here, Jesus tells you how to get it right. Three steps to take. First, Jesus says, come to me, come to Jesus. Notice he puts it about him, not about rituals, not about feasts and festivals, not about going to the synagogues, not about wearing phylacteries on your head or having the, the borders of your garments extend underneath your suit coat. He said, come to me. It's about me, knowing me, following me, serving me. Jesus made it about himself. Many times we as Christians use the phrase that our faith is not a religion, it's a relationship. And quite honestly, an unbelieving world mocks us for that saying. They say, oh, y'all say that all the time. That's such a trite expression. No, it's not, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Well, it may be trite, but it still is true. It's not about the trappings of religion. Even Jesus says, if you want to be right, you want to be real, come to me in a living personal relationship. That's what it is all about. The initial call of Christ is to come to him for salvation. Every one of us is born separated from God. Nobody, nobody, nobody is born knowing who God is. We're all born separated from God. We're lost. And because of our sins, we offended the almighty God. And we were lost, helpless and hopeless. But God, who is rich in mercy, saw the plight of our estate. He sent Jesus, his only begotten son, to be born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus lived a sinless life. And as he died on that cross, he died as a substitute. And Jesus received all the punishment, all the wrath of God, so you and I wouldn't have to. He paid the debt that we owed so we could have a life that he gave to us. And he died, was buried in a borrowed tomb, raised on the third day and says, now if you will confess your faith and believe in Jesus, surrender to him, now you can have life and forgiveness. That's the initial call. Has there ever been a time in your life where you surrender to Jesus, that you came to Jesus as your savior and Lord? If not, that's where it begins. If you wanna have real faith, it begins by having a personal relationship. And you can do that today. In your heart, in your prayer, confess your sins and yield to Jesus as Savior and Lord. And the Bible says you will be saved. So that's the initial call, but, but you know what? It doesn't end there. Every day thereafter, Jesus keeps saying, come to me for strength and for godliness and for, for sustenance. His grace saves us and then his grace sustains us each and every day. But it begins by coming to him. Indeed, it's all about Jesus. The second way to be the real deal is submit to Jesus. That's where he uses this Jewish expression about the yoke. He's really not talking about a a yoke of oxen out there trying to work in a field like a farmer. When certain Jewish folks followed certain rabbis, that was considered being under that rabbi's yoke, under his teaching, the way he interpreted the law, the expectations he had. That's why even today, some faithful Jewish folks have those long curly sideburns and some don't. That's why some have the tassels hanging out from their coat jacket and some don't. That's why some have certain attire and hats that they wear and some don't. Because in a large sense, it depends which rabbi are they following, whose yoke are they under. What Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Don't follow all the trappings and the heavy burdens of the scribes and Pharisees. Take my yoke upon me. Come under my teaching. Come under my lordship. My burden, he says, is easy. My yoke is easy, verse 30. My burden is light. To submit to Jesus. Have you come under the yoke of Jesus? Faith isn't right if faith isn't real. And real faith is submitted to Jesus. Have you submitted your marriage to Jesus? Have you submitted your finances to Jesus? Those of you in the last year or two, your college work, have you submitted your coming career unto Jesus? Have you submitted your leisure time unto Jesus? Have you submitted your heart and mind, soul and strength, everything? Have you submitted to Jesus? 
because you're not really committed to Jesus unless you're submitted to Jesus. And the third thing Jesus says here is rest in me. We come to Jesus, we submit to Jesus, then we rest in Jesus. In verse 28, he says, the scribes and the Pharisees, that's labor and you'll be heavy laden, but I, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and you will find rest for your souls. That sense of rest means you don't have to strive anymore. You don't have to earn God's favor. You don't have to be better than everybody else. You rest in the safety and the security that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And your worth is not based on your activity. Your purpose in life is not determined by your career. You're resting in Jesus. It's really, as some people often say, the difference between the words do and done. Religion tells you to do a bunch of things. You gotta do this, you gotta do this, you can't do this, you can't do that. But Jesus says everything's already been done. And you find safety and shelter, salvation and peace, and you rest in Jesus. How many of you today need to quit your striving, quit your angst, quit trying to earn another rung up the spiritual ladder, and you just need to rest in Jesus and rest in him? Remember, we're using these Connect cards as our response uh, tool. If you're a, a recent attendee, you may not have seen what these are. These smaller, these, these are intended for you to pull out of the rack and just take home with you. Those of you on live stream, this is available at fbcworld.church. You scan that QR code with your phone camera, bring up a simple form. You can let us know if you've got questions about baptism. We baptized a young man at the 930 service. Questions about who can be a church member, what that means or doesn't mean. Maybe you have questions about children's ministry or you want to talk to somebody about becoming a follower of Jesus. Or you've got questions about uh, some prayer need in your life. Well, you can use this to communicate with us and we'll follow up with you and just help in a way that we can. So, so please take note of that. But let me ask you what your response will be today. How many or who in this room needs to respond that first way, need to come to Jesus? Does this need to be the day where you yield to Jesus as Savior and Lord, realizing that you've been far away from God and only Jesus can bring you close to him. How many of you need to respond that way? Or secondly, how many of you need to respond by yielding to Jesus? Is that your response? Is there some area of your life that you need to yield to him? If so, why not today? And who here today needs to find rest in Christ? Find that peace, comfort, and fulfillment knowing that Jesus has done all that needs to be done. And I pray as God has been teaching you today, you will respond as God's Holy Spirit has led you now. Let's pray together before we sing our final song. Lord, we know that it is through your Holy Spirit using your word that you teach us and strengthen us. And I pray that as we've considered these words of Jesus that you have taught us about how we can live with real faith, authentic faith, that honors and pleases you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing the song of commitment, the song of faith, and declare that we're gonna come unto Jesus for all that we would ever need. Lord, I come and I confess bowing here I find my rest 